the thought of leaving such a great career that I was really thriving in at Goldman Sachs to start ultimately a hair care product line was in a lot of ways pretty risky. Hello and welcome to Shopify Masters, your companion for starting and building a business. I'm Shwang Esther Shan. Even though Nancy Twine had a thriving career in finance, chemistry and tinkering with home beauty remedies had her heart. It's a ritual she shared with her mom and grandmother. And so while Nancy worked on Wall Street, she started her brand Briogeo, selling clean and natural hair products that cater to all hair types. That was a decade ago. Today, Briogeo is sold in Sephora stores all over the world. And in 2022, the brand was acquired by the Wella Company. Nancy still runs Briogeo as a CEO, and it's about to become a nine-figure business. Nancy joins me now to share her journey from formulating products to retail partnerships to being acquired and what's next. Welcome to the show, Nancy. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Very excited to chat, and I wanted to start with some of your early beauty memories. I know that your mom and grandmother used to make hair and beauty products at home, so tell us about some of those early memories tinkering with formulas. Yeah, absolutely. I definitely have a very sort of early childhood connection with beauty products and chemistry. My mom was both a physician and a chemist. And so through her chemistry background, she knew all about how to emulsify water and oil and just create these really incredible textures. And so growing up, I would go with my mom to our local health food store and they had, you know, every sort of ingredient and potion under the sun, but everything was sort of single ingredient. So you could buy the best organic coconut oil or jojoba seed oil or rosemary extract, or dead sea salts. I mean, it was just a chemist's dream. And we would go to the health food store, we would pick out all these different ingredients, bring them back home, and I would basically watch my mom transform them into these really beautiful and highly functional beauty products. And, you know, for me, one of the reasons why I really loved making products at home was, you know, at the time I was very young, so I wasn't wearing um, makeup or skincare, but I have naturally curly hair. And I remember how hard it was for me and my mom to find products and formulas that really worked for my texture because I need a lot of moisture. The products also have to have a lot of slip, which is you know, the ability to ease a comb through the hair. And so many of the products just didn't work. So being able to take these ingredients and transform them into the types of formulas we needed was really magical to me growing up. And this interest really followed you through your studies as well. I understand in high school, you really loved learning chemistry through science classes. Yeah. So during high school, I took anything I could really take that fell into that sort of, you know, biology or or chemistry subject, because I just loved the idea of being able to learn about everything from anatomy to ingredients and the periodic table and how you could combine these single elements and turn them into something else. So That sort of transformation aspect is something that has always excited me, and I've always been curious about it, even though I didn't end up studying chemistry or biology in college. Ultimately, I took a little bit of a different route, but I've always definitely had a strong interest in the sciences. And that different route led you to the finance world. You had a career in Goldman Sachs before you started Briogeo. What kind of learnings did you pick up through working on Wall Street that really prepped you for this business? So I spent the first seven years of my career working at Goldman Sachs in commodity sales and trading. And I started my career at Goldman right out of college in 2007. And if you can recall back to that year, it was actually the start of a financial crisis. So 
I came into an environment that was really challenging. People who had been, you know, veterans in the industry were seeing things that they had never seen before. But, you know, one of the things that I can relate to that actually is very much the experience that an entrepreneur goes down in terms of facing the unforeseen every day. And with that comes the need to really be creative because when you're faced with a challenge or an obstacle or a situation that you haven't experienced before, you can't really tap into sort of your knowledge base of knowing immediately what to do. You have to get creative and create these unique solutions. So I kind of felt like throughout my finance career, so much of what I had to navigate was new information, finding new solutions to problems that didn't exist anymore. And I feel like that level of just sort of discipline and relentless pursuit, despite the obstacle, definitely created a really strong foundation for my entrepreneurial journey. And you also did all sorts of research before starting Briogeo. You even went to the New York Small Business Library. What were you looking for? The thought of leaving such a great career that I was really thriving in at Goldman Sachs to start ultimately a hair care product line was in a lot of ways pretty risky. And I've always been taught to take smart risks. So I knew that if I was going to leave my career in finance to start my own company, I wanted to feel really good about what I was going to embark on. I wanted to make sure that I was launching in an industry that was growing and that had a large addressable market so that I had people to sell my products to. Also, you know, I launched a clean beauty product line before the clean beauty movement had really taken off. So I did a lot of research to understand was clean beauty just going to be a short-lived trend or was it here to stay? And is that how the industry was going to evolve? So, so much of that early research that I was doing was really leveraging these trend reports and insights to, you know, make sure that I was doing something that was smart and that was going to have longevity. I really love this aspect of your story because I think sometimes it's counterintuitive to the entrepreneur stories we hear where people are taking the plunge and they risk it all versus your story is very much about investing the time and also taking that smart risk. I understand you were working for almost three years at Goldman while building up the brand. So how did you manage both those roles in those years? It was pretty challenging, but it was also a very unique time for me because I had lost my mom and kind of pouring myself into this passion project really became like a form of therapy for me. So when I would come home from work, my nights and weekends, I was able to really pour myself into this passion project. And so I had to really be, you know, smart with how I was using my time to be able to really dedicate to getting things off the ground. But I think one of the things that I did that was really smart was that early on, I found people who could help me. So when I was working my day job, there were people behind the scenes who were helping with other things. So for example, I ended up hiring a cosmetic chemist who was working on the formulas while I was working my day job. I hired an agency to help me with the branding and the marketing. So I really focused my time on the things that were really, really special to my talents, which is coming up with formula concepts and briefs and working on product names and marketing concepts. So I was really able to do all of those things in my nights and weekends. And it sounds like you were funding your own business with this full-time job and kind of giving yourself more of a runway to experiment and see if this brand was something that could take off. Definitely. And so that was a big part of it as well. So, you know, I talked about doing my research to make sure that I was making a smart bet, but also hanging on to my full time job was also another way to kind of give me leverage as I was proving out my business concept. So I didn't have the stress of trying to figure out how I was going to pay my bills or make ends meet because I had, you know, income from a career coming in. So I think that really helped me mentally. It helped me to kind of take my time and go slow and be thoughtful about every step. 
as opposed to trying to kind of rush things because I felt like, oh my gosh, I have such a short runway to be able to start making revenue. And at what stage were you fully comfortable with becoming a full-time entrepreneur? So one of the most pivotal moments in that early beginning stages of my entrepreneurial journey was actually getting interest from Sephora, who ultimately became Briochio's first major retail partner. They're still one of our top global retail partners now. And when I landed the Sephora contract back in 2013, we ended up launching in 2014, I knew that I was going to have to focus on it full time. There was just no way that I was going to be able to make such a big account like that succeed if I wasn't 100% focused on it. But it also gave me a really solid proof point that such a big retailer would be interested in what I had to offer and the fact that there was a revenue stream that was going to come in. And so it was just such a pivotal and major proof point that really gave me the confidence that it was time to dedicate myself full time. Very excited to dig into more about that Sephora relationship. But before that big contract, a lot of founders have to go through that first large production run. What advice do you have for those who are taking their home recipes into a mass production? Yeah, so I will say our first formulas that we launched at Briogeo, these were sophisticated formulas that were, you know, concocted by a chemist with my direction. So they were very stable, high performance formulas. And that's something that was really, really important to me because I knew that if we were going to launch places like Sephora, we couldn't have the types of formulas that I had growing up, which needed to be refrigerated, had a very short shelf life, and also weren't leveraging some of the more advanced natural ingredient actives. So the formulas that Briogeo are rooted in are very different from the formulas that I grew up using. But you're totally right in that a lot of beauty brand founders kind of forget about the less glamorous aspects of launching a beauty brand because it's so easy to become sort of caught up in the innovation and the marketing and the branding. But the finance and operations piece is so, so critical. And, you know, one of the biggest challenges I actually had starting out was I had to move my shipping operation from my studio apartment in the East Village to an actual warehouse because I couldn't palletize cases of products at home. Like I needed support with that. So that was a big sort of obstacle I had to navigate early on, which was starting to professionalize a lot of my operations. And I think another aspect of growth is going to trade shows, which you found success in. What advice do you have for people who are thinking of investing in attending in a trade show to make sure that they make the most out of those opportunities? Yeah, it's it's a really great opportunity for anyone who's starting out in an unknown or unfamiliar industry where perhaps you don't have a lot of contacts or network people to tap into. What I will say is that trade shows can be really overwhelming, very large. There's lots of different sections. So the first thing that you want to do is really understand the lay of the land and where it makes sense for you to show up in a part of a show because it can make all the difference as it relates to the types of people who will come to your booth and the types of people that you'll meet. So that's critical. And then when you do figure out that part, you want to figure out, okay, how can I best represent my brand and what we do visually in the space that you're renting? So getting really, really creative with your booth design and layout will really help to attract people and help to storytell your brand for you. I would say the next thing is come very well hydrated and prepared to do a lot of talking because I will tell you, working the trade show floor is probably one of the most exhausting things I've done in my life. There's a lot of talking, a lot of interacting, but you have to bring the energy to everyone that you meet. It's really, really critical. And then just making sure that you're proactive about getting contacts. You never want to be that person that said, oh my gosh, I met the perfect person and totally forgot to get their card or information. So keeping that top of mind is really critical also. 
Very excited to chat more, Nancy. I'm chatting with Nancy Twine, founder and CEO of Briogeo. I hope you're enjoying our conversation. And if you haven't already, please subscribe or follow Shopify Masters wherever you get your podcasts and leave us a review or feedback for the show. Thanks. So Briogeo is on the more affordable end of premium hair care products. How did you approach pricing and customer education to balance being both competitive and profitable? That was definitely a real priority for me because of the fact that Briogeo is really rooted in the concept of hair care for all. So whether it's hair texture type or where someone is in their life, we really want to be that sort of approachable, attainable, but premium hair care brand that you can rely on. So making sure that our price structure aligned to that was really important. So it's really important to analyze your costs. And I will say that oftentimes clean formulas are more expensive than their non-clean counterparts because a lot of the different you know, natural ingredients, whether they're concentrated oils or extracts or other actives, tend to be more expensive. And you have to make sure that you're maintaining the right margin so that you can invest in people, building a team, marketing, and all of the overhead that goes into running a brand while also making sure that you're not pricing out your customer. So those are some of the things that we really looked at when we were pricing our products. And then again, making sure that we weren't the most expensive hair care brand out there. And to do that, you have to really understand how your competition is priced. So that becomes sort of a a metric for how you can stay on that attainable end of pricing. The relationship with Sephora is something you've had for a very long time, and you are still one of the top brands at Sephora. So what advice do you have for establishing and maintaining retail partnerships over the years? One of the biggest things that I've learned about the retail partnership is that it really is a two-way relationship in which both parties are really supporting each other towards you know, the common goal of, of driving a brand's success. I feel so privileged that Sephora took a bet on me and you know put me on their shelves very early on. And luckily we made such a great opportunity for the both of us over the years. But like I said, it was definitely very much a, a mutual sort of arrangement. So I had to spend a lot of my time as a founder training their sales teams so that they could represent the brand well in store. I've done tons of master classes. We've invested in sampling. We've invested in digital. And we've really, you know, worked together to leverage their insights and their perspective to make sure that we were building the business with them as opposed to relying on them for all of our success. Sounds like Sephora is not just a retail distributor, but it's also a marketing channel. A few years ago, I remember Briogeo being one of the birthday gifts that helps you to be discovered by so many new customers. So how did that initiative come to be? Yeah, so Sephora really is not just a retailer, but they are an incredible marketer and such an incredible way to get products into the hands of that beauty junkie. And for us, you know, sampling has been a really big part of our strategy from day one, whether we were sampling through Sephora or through other opportunities. And we also knew that even though we had been sampling and doing lots of marketing with Sephora, there was still so much untapped potential in terms of really penetrating their total audience. So there's still, you know, a high number of Sephora clients that don't even know Briogeo exists. So we really identified that opportunity together. And we thought that the birthday gift would be like just such an incredible opportunity to not only get clients to experience Briogeo through that sampling program, but you know, we were at the cash wrap of every Sephora store nationwide. So just having that visibility was so impactful to the brand. You actually bootstrapped the business for a very long time. At what stage were you ready to seek outside investment? And what were you looking for in these investors? For the first six years of running Briogeo, I bootstrapped using my own cash, credit cards, bank debt, 
And six years in, I decided to partner with a private equity firm called BMG Partners. They're based out in Northern California. And I actually knew the CFO at BMG because we went to college together. I didn't know him in college, but I knew him post-college. And we had just been developing a relationship over the years. So trust is something that's super important to me, especially when it comes to something that you've been building, that you've poured all of your savings and life into. Making sure that you have a partner that's really aligned with your vision and where you want to take your company is just so, so critical because it's true. Financial partnership is in a lot of ways like a marriage. You know, it's a legally binding agreement. And before you enter into that, you want to make sure that you're very clear with what it is you want, how you operate, what you need from your partner so that you can have a really successful and aligned outcome. And I'm so grateful for the partnership that I had with BMG because it wasn't just a financial one, but they were so critical in helping me build out my team, get more strategic about how I was operating my company, professionalizing the organization, and then you know ultimately helping the company get to a successful exit three years later. So private equity is actually something a lot of founders are afraid of. They feel like venture capitalists are more hands-off and they don't lose a lot of control with their company. Can you share a bit more about this decision to go with the PE route? Yeah. And so, you know, really it's all about timing. So VCs are typically earlier stage investors. And during an early stage of running a brand, at least was the case for Briogeo, I was doing so much testing and learning. We didn't have a ton of resources to, you know, invest in a lot of different areas, including building out a more sophisticated organization. And so in some ways, it kind of makes sense that VCs are hands off because it's so hard to apply a playbook to a company that's so early stage, which is why private equity partners that tend to be more strategic in their partnership will come in later. So when a company is ready for that sort of next stage of growth, so there's typically more capital on the balance sheet and there's more to work with in the P&L. And it's really that point where you do need not just the money, but a strategic partner. And so the way that those two sort of investor types work, it really does make sense that private equity is going to be more of a strategic partner than a VC at that later stage. And this relationship has really helped you to join the Wella company through an acquisition. What advice do you have for founders when they are pitching and looking for buyers? I think it's really important to just be honest with yourself about why you're selling your company. For Briogeo, it was really about how do we get the resources and the support and infrastructure to continue to sustain our growth? And how can we find a partner that's really synergistic to what we do as a brand? And one of the things that's so unique about Well as a partner is that they have a core competency in hair care. And they're doing a lot of things that align with our future growth initiatives. So, you know, that was some of the self-reflection that I did when I was coming to a decision. But I think it's, you know, being very clear on what sort of value add you're looking to get from a partner and how that's going to help you continue to scale your growth. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the themes we talked a lot about throughout our conversation is the fact that the natural hair care category has expanded. It's changed a lot in the last decade. What trends are you excited about now within the industry? One of the things that I'm really excited to see is that over the years, the hypothesis about clean came true. You know, back in 2010, when I was doing all this research, I read that clean beauty wasn't going to be just a short-lived trend, but it was how the industry was going to evolve. And we're definitely seeing that, you know, even some of the major retailers like Sephora and Ulta actually have their own clean standards and clean programs. So I'm really excited to see more brands get on board, not just only with clean, but also with sustainability, which is so, so important because in beauty, packaging is such a big part of the product. And it really does take 
more of a concerted effort within the industry to really make an impact in terms of how we can reduce waste and just be more sustainable over the long term. So that's something that I'm really, really excited about. And then I'm also excited to just see how the different categories continue to kind of merge and play off each other. So much of what has happened in skincare has impacted what's happened in hair care. And I think kind of seeing those lines blur and we're learning from each other across category is going to be really pivotal in driving a lot of the future innovation and beauty. Mm -hmm. And you were certainly a trailblazer in this category, but currently I think each year there's more and more different brands that's launching. How do you feel about just having more competition in a category that you kind of carved out in the beginning? Overall, beauty has had a lot of new entrants over the past few years, and I actually think it's really great for everyone. There are so many people in the world that it's really hard to tap out of market share. So I've never really viewed competition as something that was going to hurt me and my brand's growth. I just view it as more people coming in educating on the category, educating on clean and sustainability. And the more that we can, you know, educate the consumer, the better that is for everyone. And so I even mentor some of my competitors because I really do believe that we lift each other up and we make the category bigger when we support each other. I love that. And I know that education and sharing knowledge is your next big focus. Tell us more about how you're building a hub of resources and sharing your learnings. Yeah, I'm so excited because March is actually Women's History Month, and it's also the timing of the launch of a content site that I'm building at nancytwine.com. And the mission is all about empowering females to live a life well-lived and create success around some of the most important life pillars, whether it's navigating a career, personal finance, relationships. And I'm just really, really excited because I've learned so much over the years. I've also met some incredible experts in these areas. And I'm just excited to bring all of this knowledge and insight to really help to support other people on their journeys. That's amazing. And we're very excited to visit nancytwine.com. Awesome. I can't wait. Thank you so much for being here, Nancy. Thank you so much for having me. This was so incredible and so fun. That's Nancy Twine, founder and CEO of Briogeo. And thank you for joining us on Shopify Masters. Our show is produced by Megan Coyle and Gogo Zoger. Our engineers are Matt Schwartz and Miku Betlam. Benjamin Gottlieb is our supervising producer. And I'm Shuang Esser-Shan. And we will see you next time. <laughs>